Do you think uh, Sam Altman lifts? I feel like lifting is uh, like up and coming among tech folks. I feel a lot more people are, are posting. <laughs> he's not about quite it. So on he the Zuckerberg probably has a end. Personal trainer, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think he's going to the octagon or <laughs> or mm-hmm. like you know doing creatine yet. He, he's not Zuck. He's not gone for the full like I'm going to wear my own designer T-shirts and grow the hair out and 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 kind of go full full tech bro mode and, and, and own it. He's definitely in a different space. Very different. Although character. Simon, and this relates to our topic today, he is the last man standing. So maybe he is. He's gotten fiercer than than we give him credit for. We, he's got pretty fierce. Like uh, what, to raise the largest VC round in history. Uh, to have, be the only founder left from OpenAI, so all of the Ilya's gone, uh, Kevin's gone. Like there's, there's just him left to shift it to a for-profit company and to raise six point six billion, the largest VC round in history at a hundred and fifty-seven billion dollar valuation, making them the third largest private tech company in the world. Yeah, okay, that that was a big lift. I'll I'll give him that. He he, he did okay. Yeah. But it is that like are we at peak open AI? Is that it's all downhill now? Like open AI is screwed, all of the founders have left, all of the like SoftBank invested. Massa Sun is back. This is bubble territory. Open AI is so screwed, surely. What do you what say you? Yeah. I I think the question of like, is this peak open AI? It's kind of an interesting question because it hints at a couple of different things. I think the most interesting one is why is it reasonable to say the answer is maybe yes? And I think it would be reasonable because you can say it's very competitive space. Building these foundational models requires huge CapEx, only it's not really CapEx because as soon as you train these things, they become relatively obsolete. So it's not like you're putting it into like a Tesla Gigafactory. It's like you're putting it into what is basically a file with some weights in it that becomes obsolete. So I think that's the, the bear case for why OpenAI is like at its peak, because we're getting to this place where you've got trillion-dollar tech companies that are also leaning into this. You've got Zuckerberg, who literally is in the octagon, <laughs> not mm-hmm. to mention you know, has said, like, I'm focusing my whole company on this. So that, that's the bear case for peak OpenAI. But, but I, don't even, I don't even like thinking about it in terms of like, is this peak open AI? What, what I love thinking about is, oh my God, these models are amazing. And the fact that they exist in a competitive market with well-capitalized players, and these models are being pushed out to all of us for use, that, that is super exciting. And so the reason you can have that conversation is because of the competitive dynamics. Like once, once Google got on the throne for search and put a tax on the internet, they stayed. They stayed for yeah. basically, you know, till today. Maybe today that's starting to change. And then I feel like I'm talking a lot here, so I want to hear your thoughts too. But the other thing I think about is there's this great quote. Um, I forget who said it, but it's related to what's called the productivity paradox. And the quote goes something like this. It says, we can see the technology revolution everywhere except in the productivity numbers. And so if you pull up huh. economic growth in the U.S., since the post-war period, you'll see the 60s, the 70s are, are ripping. Now, part of that's, you know, recovery, the baby boom, some of that sort of stuff. The 80s is the beginning of the IT revolution. The 90s is internet, you know, the 2000s to a little bit later is cloud, and then we have mobile. Those changed a lot about how the world operates. But growth during those periods, productivity growth, is lower And I think what's so exciting about this, again, because these models are competitive, they're made broadly available, I think economists, now it's early, they would say like, yes, we believe there's a story to tell about productivity growth for these models in a way that's not true for what we've seen in the internet, cloud, or mobile. And that, to me, is incredibly exciting because what we need is growth. And then that can get plugged into the rest of the economy, which... This is how we can take the conversation about open AI and start talking about fintech and financial services. 
No, the, well, fintech and financial services were the probably the biggest beneficiaries from mobile outside of the Western markets, right? So M-Pesa and you look at New Bank and you look at all of the things that sort of grew and sprung out of fintech, but it was... Toss, yeah. Yeah, oh my goodness. Um, so, I think super financial. consumer super apps in greenfield markets, New Bank, yes. Toss, you know, uh, Revolut is a little bit different, but... Huge, huge outcomes riding what is probably mostly the mobile wave on top of you know cloud internet, uh, cloud and uh, and and yeah, and, and a lot of that that revolution. But yeah. then you know that was sort of like cost disruption, not necessarily productivity disruption to to some extent. And so yeah. now the question is, well, so where does this I don't even know if cost disruption so much as taking customers that people didn't want like the other banks didn't want, and then figuring out how to make them work, which is related to having a better cost base, but it's also yeah, related to just it. taking these people that they couldn't figure out how to serve, right? Um, by which is still the, hugely important. By lowering the barrier of like the hurdle rate of pro- uh, profitability, they, they kind of got yeah. there. But then what what's the AI story for fintech? And I, I, I genuinely don't know that. Like, it's, I've been fascinated about it. I've been blogging about it. I have hypotheses. Yeah. There's some stuff I'm seeing. But what are you seeing? Yeah. I don't know exactly what the story is, but I know it's going to be a big story, and I can see some early innings of things that are very exciting. So, like, why do I think it's big? We just talked about how, like, mobile at an economic level, not as big as AI is going to be, but we still had some amazing, like Nubank is one of the most valuable financial services company in the world. Uh, and to go back to the unit economics question, their ARPUs started at like less annual revenue per user. Some people use a slightly different acronym. It's like $10. There is no bank in the US that could figure out how to properly serve a customer segment that they're doing $10 in revenue off of a year. Yeah. Now, and now they're closer to call it you know 50 and they've got other products they want to launch and they're moving up market. So that's changed. But that built some really big companies on top of mobile, right, and a lower cost structure. Now we've got this whole new paradigm that is going to have a bigger impact. And if you drill down into financial services, there are thousands of well-paid professionals who aren't doing, are doing work that models are definitely capable of, if not doing in their current iteration, doing pretty soon, especially mm-hmm. if you wrap a little tooling around that. Like one of the things we'll always talk about, because t- I think we talked about it before, Klarna customer service, but customer service inside of all the big banks a lot of the compliance roles, that's an expense story. So that's one thing I'm excited about. And I think, you know, we can be excited about as a society. As an investor, the thing that really gets me excited, though, is not cost reduction products for incumbents. It's rebundling and creating new products because the mm-hmm. marginal cost of something has gone down. And right now, the kind of advice or workflow layer on top of a core financial product, that's gone down. And so if you're building a vertical SaaS platform, and I think didn't we talk about this before for like small businesses, it used to be you could like maybe have a scheduling system and maybe like a bank account. Now you could do everything. You could have a scheduling system with like a live phone caller, a rescheduler, a biller, someone that like, you know, maybe reaches out to insurance and verifies insurance and then collects and like processes the claim. And like, that's really cool. You can basically rebundle all of these things. So I think it's going to be a huge tailwind for everything in vertical SaaS. But there are other areas that we are going to figure out and explore too. So I'll stop there because that was a lot of me talking. I want to hear kind of your reaction to that. So the the first category I call like RPA 2.0, which is doing all of the unstructured data, unstructured uh, complex non-recurring tasks. So RPA 1.0, if this, then that, and I have to build the flow chart, and if it doesn't follow the flow chart, it breaks. Whereas Gen AI comes along and doesn't need a flow chart, it's just going to figure it out and try and do the task. It's going to do yep. it on a website, a PDF, an email, and it can handle back and forth. Use cases like, I'll help you go out to 300 suppliers, find the lowest cost provider, negotiate the contract, and then help you sign the deal. So all you have to do is push go. Uh, Use cases like uh, I will scan somebody's website to see if what they're saying during onboarding is actually what their business does. Are they selling gift cards or are they actually selling gardening supplies, which they claim to in their incorporation documents? So there's like 
the yep. boring human tasks. And then can I monitor hidden. that on now a weekly, a monthly, certainly an, like I can actually monitor that on an ongoing basis in a much more cost effective way than was ever true before, which maybe so means I can serve different customers than I could ever serve before because I can take more risk because I'm mitigating that risk. So there's like the incumbents doing the thing they were already doing. And then there's the, uh, as you were saying, then the vertical SaaS companies able to embed that capability in their platform and distribute it to, yep. to those growth companies that might use it. This third category of like, okay, what new products do you build? Uh, the, the piece I'm going to write next is where are all of the consumer financial services AI companies and hallucination plus financial advice don't mix very well. Um, RIAs yep. and the, that whole space of like, should you buy this money market fund? Should you be going into stocks? How should you think about your savings? That is a very regulated activity because if you give somebody yep. bad advice and they go out of business and da da da, they they go bankrupt, that can end in like the worst possible outcomes for yep. for that individual, for that family, for whatever. When you mess with people's money, you are messing with their lives, especially with consumers. So don't mess that up. Oh, and by the way. It hallucinated and said that I should spend all of my money on a prediction market. Like, what the heck? Yeah. This is this is crazy. So, yeah, is that the gap here, or is there a rebundling of other things that you're starting to see early signs and signals of? Like, where does this where does this become real for consumers and and day to day life? Yeah, I, I had a really interesting conversation with Josh Ritholtz, founder and CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management, $4 billion earlier this week, $4 billion asset manager or, or wealth advisor that has about 4,000 families they serve. And he had a really interesting conversation of the types of services they would now consider, consider bundling into your, their platform. So this is that story of like, what would you bundle in given the new affordances? I think from first principles, if you think about what you want from your wealth manager, you don't want them to just tell you like how to invest. Honestly, that's pretty easy. It's like buy some diversified stocks and like try and track mm -hmm. the S&P and do some tax loss harvesting and you know that sort of stuff. But then the client comes and says, I want, I want tax advice, I want estate help. And you say, oh man, you know, I charge you 1% on your assets. If I do your taxes, like you probably aren't gonna want me to say, I'm gonna charge you $10,000 extra, although maybe you'll be okay. So like maybe I take a margin hit. It's a lot more work and a lot lower margin. And mm -hmm. if I screw it up, it's really bad, and it takes a ton of time. The client's very upset. So it's very, it's just way easier for me, you know, a year ago, certainly the last 10 years, to say, we don't do taxes, but here's a great group that'll do that. Today, if you get these models working and they lower the cost of delivering those services, and you wrap it with an advisor and make them more efficient so they can make sure and catch the hallucinations, mm -hmm. he's like, look, we're, we're going to start doing that. In fact, we already have. We already do it for about 10% of our clients, and we're more willing to do it than we ever were before. Because from first principles, the, the best you know, thing for your clients is to do what they want. <laughs> and what they want is like a one-stop shop. <laughs> and so yeah. like, we should start doing this for our clients. Um, I think it's an interesting deal with story about admin. why. Yeah. yeah. And no that, one likes their tax person, is, Jones. Is I don't think really it's really key. Nobody wants to do taxes. You're so right. Like nobody yeah. wants to do that. Help me deal with my admin. Help me deal with everything around it. You're already seeing my accounts and you already have to pull that administration. Why can't you just help me figure out what I should be doing with my taxes and file them? And there are a lot of these little adjacencies when it comes to the the yeah. personal P&L that you are like a mini CFO of this business and then you might have a side hustle business and a day job and a whole bunch of other stuff and yeah. there's no real help for that because the economics don't work so yeah just as as you saw with uh, and it SMB certainly doesn't bundling. work for the biggest slug of americans which is mass affluent 250k to a million in investable assets there's there's a huge gap in terms of the quality of product and service you get right now so the i think it's on the mine, table that you can build and make a good company providing some sort of bundle around those things, right? So that's that's an area too. A friend of mine described that mass affluent 250 to 1 million as affluent angsters because their cost of living has gone up by 20, 25% in real terms over the last two years. Yeah. Their salary probably hasn't gone up nearly that much and everything feels expensive. They have a bunch of credit cards. They have too much admin. They might be full-time busy, full-time work. Maybe their parents... They're sort of looking after old parents. They've got young kids relying on them. There's nowhere they're going to be able to save for their college. They're just in the grind and nobody's there It's to hard. Help. It's the grind. It's like your peak career work, your peak kids, and then for some people, your peak taking care of your parents too. Yes. That's like a... 
that's a, a tight spot to be in. And no wonder they call them angsters because, wow, like that's, that's a tight spot to be in. And then the thing is, like, just somebody help. No, 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 you've got to go look through that tiny paper document and you have to send it off in paper because that one bank that's given you the best price will only deal with paper and there's no... And then you've yeah. got to go through this convoluted, useless website that takes forever. Not that I've been through this recently, or maybe I have. Yeah. <laughs> maybe the pain you're hearing is, is exactly that. And have just AI take care of most of that for me and let me just double check everything's right before you push it? Yes, please. And oh, my wealth advisor does that? All right, yeah, I'll move my assets to you to just, just outsource it, definitely. Yep. And it, I think something about uh, well-packaged Gen AI products are very different to directly using a foundation model. Most people's experience of chat GPT is I asked it for something and it didn't quite do what I wanted, either because I'm bad at prompting or because uh, it, it's just not been packaged. It's a, it's a more generic tool. It's like using code yeah. to build something. And I wanted, you know, I wanted a Death Star, not some Lego blocks. And yeah. well packaged is, well, here's the Death Star and you can take it apart and put it back together again and yeah. here's the instructions. And I think that analogy of like, Mo you still need to package this stuff and you still need to constrain it to yeah. some use cases. Maybe with smaller models like the Llama 8 billion parameter model, and then that really suits something in financial services, especially yep. close to a customer if it's designed right. Yeah, the models have three problems in terms of actually doing things for consumers. One is they're not necessarily integrated all the data about you that they need in a way that you know a service could be. Two, they're stateless. So they, which is related to the first problem, like they don't track state about what they're doing. And threes are not fully agentic, right? Mm -hmm. But if you build a considered wrapper around those three things, you can provide the integrations, you can provide the state, and you can provide the agentic stuff directly using the models, but with like human oversight until, you know, you can move off that. And I think that's a big opportunity. There's something related to this, though, that's exciting for me as just like an observer of the financial system, which is, you know, we said the word mass affluent. Um, and then earlier in this episode, we were talking about how Newbank and others served Cusper and Chime that no one wanted. So that, to me, is a really exciting development. It used to be that the best we could hope for for new companies is to kind of pick up the scraps from mm -hmm. what the, the industry didn't want. And mass affluent, that's not the scraps. That, that is how it. banks, <laughs> you know, brokers... All of the tax advisors, that's how so many people in financial services make money. And for the first time, I think you actually have the capabilities to start bundling a set of products that serves this customer that has real problems, right? You call them the angsters or whatever, mm -hmm. and in a way that is delightful and makes money. And that's when you start to change to, the whole system. I remember speaking to uh, a very large bank a few years ago that was looking at digital transformation back in my consulting days and uh, they described the mass affluent as their window no i'm not worried about chime because they're not in my window um our yeah. window is is this place you know like uh 150 plus back in the day you know now it's 250 plus yeah. but that space is bread and butter that's where chase is making their money it's where wells is making their money it's where if you have a consumer book you are making your money in that space but it's wildly underserved but you can offer the best price because you have returns yeah. to scale now what happens if somebody could offer a better price or a better product or just commoditize the product you already have by driving it as a consumer agent? Great and example would be just high yield checking, right? That's a very small example. It's not huge value for consumers because usually they don't have that much in cash, but you get used to it. You're like, why would I ever go to a bank and get paid nothing and get no services when I could go here, get paid something and... And that's the whole deposit, cheap deposits. That's the core of the how our system works, right? It's so talking about that bundle that you can start putting together. So, the who owns the agent and who delivers it? If it's con, if it's me as a consumer and I'm subscribing to it, yeah. and it's operating um, my devices and my accounts as me. Then what's the responsibility wrapper that sits around that? It sort of it yeah. starts to feel a bit more like a broker. 
because uh, you think about uh, deposit brokers in exactly that case, what do they do? They're moving your money around to find you the the best deal, but they are a regulated entity. So who's building, to your point, REA is a classic example, who's building the broker bots? Who's building the broker agents, but that can operate on open finance to move everything from everywhere as my control center? Because that's hard to do. And once you unpick all the ways that that thing might need to be regulated in order to do the stuff yeah. you really need it to do. Uh, yeah, your your RAA space is probably one of the few with the expertise yep. to really pull that off. Yeah. And I think like the big banks, like, it will be interesting to which extent to which incumbents can benefit and try and rebundle this, but I think they're going to be pretty hamstrung by two things. One is just classic innovator's dilemma. You can't mm-hmm. commoditize a compliment like you know, a, a checking account by offering us high yield because that undercuts your core business. So, like, you just mm-hmm. can't do some of the things you want to do uh, because of your business model. And two is regulators. Imagine you're Wells Fargo and you're like, hey, we just announced our new, like, agentic AI something, <laughs> uh, right? Get, guess the first phone call you get, guess who it is? It's not a customer. No, it's, a regulator. it's Mike Sue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, hey, so we heard about this new uh, AI thing you're doing. Um, here, here are a hundred pages we'd like you to start filling out. Uh, and, and you know, from first principles, like the things that regulators are designed to look out for for a consumer makes sense. Which is like, you know, was it transparent? Yeah. Was it fair? Did it have your best interests at heart? Uh, did it prevent fraud? Did it prevent cybersecurity? Uh, is where you put your money safe and sound? It's not going to disappear. Yeah. Like. I care about all of those things. So does the regulator. The way they do it, there's just a bit of an implementation problem. This idea of they have to pass a law and then that law gets set in stone and then that gets examined and how it gets examined varies by geography and who was the examiner on that particular day. And it's really, really complex. And so... Yeah, to, to execute on that, that's where a lot of your cost comes in. It's where a lot of the yeah. institutions claim their most is. It's just managing the cost of that is extremely expensive. But to the earlier point, if compliance AI is like the boring first step of fintech AI, maybe you can start to compress some of that cost a little bit of dealing with regulation and the regulators yeah. in order to unlock the consumer side. Yeah, but even compliance AI is... It's hard for incumbents to adopt. Like I've heard stories about, you know, we want to use AI to improve like model performance, especially as relates to underserved communities. And so we're going to use, you know, new AI models to do that. And basically, I can't remember the CFPB or the OCC or some other group was like, yeah, like no AI in models for now. And so like if, it's the same thing if you apply that to other workflows. Even if you're trying to do the right thing in some of the compliance workflows, and you know, underwriting is different from you know, like an AML workflow, but you're still going to get a lot of questions, and that could be yeah, difficult. Yeah, so there's um, ECOA and Truth in Lending and FACRA and a few others where you unpack them, and uh, but but I think there's there's a um, there's this design of this desire of fear of like actually showing your thinking and playing the long game with them that yeah. i find financial institutions the, there's a few that do it but most don't i've worked yeah. in some that have done it i've worked with some that do which is like they bore the regulator to death with all of the things that they're going to do for two years and then launch <laughs> it and it's like we want to meet with you and the regulator says okay we'll take a look at it because so the regulator's like ha, i'm gonna get you yeah. I, I, i'm gonna catch you on something yeah and they just show them something they're thinking about and they go oh, okay yeah no no concerns and then they just keep going yeah. and showing them and showing them and showing them and it's each time it's a little bit further ahead and then they launch it um, so this is where Microsoft's yeah. been quite interesting is that they've given a lot of people comfort inside the um, inside the large institutions. I was with the global head of retail from a European bank just earlier today. And uh, I was saying to him that like it seems like there's a lot of very shy adopters of AI inside corporates. And he said, yes, absolutely. And there's a bunch of reasons mm-hmm. for that, which is if – so. Uh, co-pilots are available inside of the Microsoft Office suite. But if you're using that really effectively in your day job, then you look like a hero. And so do you want to give that up? 
And do you want to yeah. lose that position inside the company? And also, do you want to lose your budget because now you're being productive and you can't do the things that you want to do? So the the yeah. corporate politics make it very hard to to be good at using the AI. Um, and then the external politics of dealing with the regulator are not always easy because you have to walk them there. But they've done a good job in some geographies of doing that. That's where I got that 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 anecdote from. Yeah. Of like bore them to death with with all of the things you intend to do if it's new. Um, but you have to have a receptive regulator on the other side of the table for that. And that's not always the case. Um, sometimes it's just yeah. like, nope, the answer is no. Um, what's the question? So it ke- one of the things that keeps me in business and the companies I back um, excited about the future. But I think we can wrap it up and talk about like the so what. So we started out peak open AI. Peak open AI, what do you, what do you think there? Yes, but not peak AI. Um, where do you stand on peak yeah. AI? Totally not peak AI. Uh, even if the models, like scaling stops, just the models we have today, integrating them will take time, and they still have a lot of room to run. And I think they are going to get a lot better. And this is the thing I'm most excited about is peak AI in financial services. I think it's one of the biggest areas to apply it to. And I think it's also underhyped, which to me, <laughs> there's, like, there's, less, there's less noise here, right? I don't have... Uh, a company, at least not one I can tell you about, that has raised $6 billion at a $100 billion valuation because people are like, AI and fintech, right? People are kind of negative on fintech. But this, this stuff has to meet the, like the rubber has to meet the road somewhere when you start applying these things. And financial services is this huge area that's oh, incredibly right for application and new bundles. And I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that in the productivity of the teams I back, the cash efficiency of the back, the ambition of their product visions. And so I, I feel like I get to have my cake and eat it too, where like if I want to invest in open AI, it's like, all right, you want to write a check into a $160 billion round? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I get to write a check into like an amazing team with an amazing vision for the future where AI can have this transformative impact at, at you know, a thousandth, a thousandth the price. And that's, that's exciting to me as an investor. I, I, uh, think, and for, I think for the teams too, so... I think people forget that uh, financial services is the world's largest profit pool. People forget that it's a horizontal. Nearly every company has a finance team um, or a, yeah. some sort of financial services arm to it. Not every company has an insurance team. Not every company has like an electricity or a utilities team, but they have a finance team. Um, and every yeah. consumer deals with finances. But they, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you realize like it is the substrate yeah. to the economy. It's the incentive mechanism for the species. You can't do anything without doing finance. So why wouldn't AI apply there? Why is that underhyped? And that's yeah. maybe something to talk about the financial Shh, Don't tell anyone, folks. Simon. Please <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> okay, deal. We'll, we'll stop right here. Yeah. But I want to double-click on what, one thing you said, which is largest profit pool. And that relates to what we were talking about before. You used to take the customers no one wanted. Now you're going after the, like, the meat. And that's interesting, too. Like we, I think we are going to – like we're kind of 3% market penetration of – you know, startups into financial services, that's going to change. Even if it was just 15% in the next 10 years, that would be 5x bigger than the last 10 years. We have a bunch of multi, you know, decacorns. That's, we're going to see a bunch more multi decacorns, and that's exciting. Some of those might be companies that already exist, right? Just building and expanding their roadmaps more, more quickly. Um, but some of those are going to be net new companies in financial services. Uh, and that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, my friend. Good place to leave it. Till next time. Till next time.